Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fast Talkers as we look at the week that was with no F1, but of course we now go into a triple header and I found three fabulous people to talk all about life in Formula One and motorsport. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our wonderful panel today. Uh, first of all, let's go to India and speak to Niharika Gore Prade, motorsport <laughs> correspondent enough, at yeah. um, Sakal Times. How are you and how is life? Well, I've been good and life's all right. I have to sit it out this season, so it's a bit weird given the circumstances. So yeah, so far so good. Yeah, what's it been like with coronavirus at home for you? What's life like over there? Well, life's normal. We're still under lockdown. Um, it's not easy. And it's a bit weird, but um, I guess for me, it's just watching Grand Prix on TV for now, which, which I haven't done in a long while, not in the last five years. So that's a bit different. But yeah, I guess it's one of those seasons you sit it out. So yeah, that's that. Yeah, I think a lot of us are all in the same boat. Now, um, yeah. next up, let me introduce you to um, Christian Manath. Now, he is uh, managing editor of F1 at motorsportmagazine.com. And Christian, you always come on the press conferences on a Thursday looking very smart with a very cool background as well. Where are you and how do you manage to always look so cool? <laughs> uh, thanks, Jenny. Unfortunately, I don't have a good background now because I'm just home and not in the office. So sorry for the background. Hope I, I can help with some beer. That's better than the background <laughs> I have in, in the office. And <laughs> yeah, but thanks, Jenny. Christian, tell me the story about the beer. What beer are you drinking and why is it relevant? <laughs> I don't want to advertise something, but that's a um, Spital beer. It's a local brewery from my hometown. And uh, I had a chat with Otmar Schaffnauer from, from Raising Point back then. It was Force India. And they, he always had a beer in the, the media session because it's a quite relaxed team, if you know them. Um, so you can have a beer at the media session. And then Formula One got a beer sponsor. And I said, oh, Otma, it cannot be possible that you drink that beer. I bring you some proper stuff from, from Bavaria. So the next race, I brought him some, some different beers from Bavaria. And one of them was the Spital beer. The next day, he came to me and said, ah, where can I get the Spital beer? Where can I get the Spital beer? And I told him it's just a small brewery in Germany in a small town in Bavaria. So um, I started to bring some beer with me um, just for Otma to the races. And last year in Italy, in Monza, I discovered something special, a forklift coming out of the Racing Point hospitality with a lot of cases of that Spital beer. So um, now he has more Spital beer than I have. So he has to give me some. So not only um, the motorsporting, you know, editor and managing editor of F1, but also a good sales rep for your local brewery. Love it. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't get a provision for that, but yeah. <laughs> Not to worry, at least you can drink it, it's nice. Um, and our final guest uh, this week I would like to introduce you to is Mark Gallagher, um, the Managing Director of Performance Insights. Mark, good evening to you. You've always had so many connections with Formula One, it was hard to pick which one to advertise you as at the moment, but just tell me what your season's been like, what life is like for you under lockdown. It's been very interesting because the with the absence of racing, uh, at least during March, April, May and June, I ended up really busy working with a number of sponsors who were desperate for content um, because with the absence of racing, they didn't have anything else to to broadcast. And you probably know, Jenny, I do a lot of work with uh, former racing drivers who are closer to my age than probably to your age. So uh, I do a lot of work with Mika Hakkinen, for example, and Mika and I ended up working on quite a few uh, promotional things and podcasts during lockdown so bizarrely it was uh, it was quite a busy time but I, like everyone i'm delighted to see the sport hitting the racetracks once again and the last few weeks have been really interesting i mean i have to say for me i still find it fascinating even if lewis and mercedes are uh, in danger of running away with it again but uh, really super to uh, see formula one and uh, i know we're going to talk about the way in which formula one have put together the the final world championship calendar which they've uh, they've finalized today yeah, it's great news that the calendar's finally been announced. It must have been such hard work putting together, as you say, Mark. We'll come to that. We'll also talk Sebastian Vettel because we can't do a show without talking Sebastian Vettel, especially when Christian's on. But first of all, I want to ask, bearing in mind we all had a week off of motorsport and Formula One last weekend, 
which is a precious commodity. Did everybody watch the Indy 500? And if you did, what did you think? If you didn't, what did you do that was more interesting? Uh, let's start with Mark. Yes, I watched the Indy 500 fully and was delighted with the outcome because Takuma Sato drove for us at Jordan, of course, uh, way back in the early 2000s. And I, I always had a good relationship with him and with his, his management team at the time, which included Andrew Gilbert Scott, who was a, a former racing driver who I'd gotten to know well in the 1980s and 90s. So Takuma, I, I think I have a soft spot for him for lots of reasons. He's a very gentle man and uh, a formidable racing driver. And for him to take a second Indy 500 win as a Japanese driver for Honda, I think he's gone from being iconic in Japan to he's probably kind of godlike now, I think, at home in, uh, in Japan. And, and it was a marvellous victory. And I'm going to say something slightly controversial, Jenny, which is that watching the coverage, there, was, there were a couple of points when I felt that the American commentators were being slightly negative about Takuma. And they, they, they were suggesting that Scott Dixon, who finished second in, in the end, was, was, going to, was going to get him and win the race. And I kind of felt there was a little bit of bias creeping into the commentary. So I have to admit, the last uh, 20 minutes of the race, I felt a very, very weird sensation come over me, which I kind of had to examine for a while. Then I realized that I was excited. And, um, and I haven't been that excited about the, fin you know, the finish here race for quite a while. And I, I really felt the tension for Taku and for the team. And uh, although he finished the race, you know, as, the, as you know, the race was finished uh, effectively uh, under yellow flags. The, the, the reality was it was a well-earned victory. So I was really delighted <coughs> with the outcome, even though uh, Scott Dixon certainly seemed to have the slightly faster car and uh, might have nicked it had it gone to the full distance. Um, Neharika, did you watch it? Yes, I did. I joined midway around lap 60 odd. So, yeah, I watched it from then and um, yeah, I liked it. But this is only the second indie that I've properly watched. So both the last indie was also won by Takuma. And I watched it at the McLaren Motorhome. So every time I watch it, I think he wins. And yeah, Alonso had a bad race. But uh, I felt bad for Alexander Rossi. At some point, I felt he was doing really well. And then everything just took a turn. So I felt, I felt it was an exciting race, better than the last one I'd watched. But yeah, it was nice. It was a nice change, apart from F1. For me, it was nice not to actually have to work through a race. It was nice yeah. just to be able to watch it as a fan, as a spectator, and not have to think, okay, who do I need to phone now? Who do I need to get to? How can I access this information? It was just, well, I can sit back, I can relax, I can have some wine, I can really enjoy this. And I really did enjoy it. Christian, what do you think? Yeah, I had a very similar day because um, before it was already DTM, MotoGP and then the evening there was the Indy 500 and usually it's always the same weekend as Monaco. So we always watch it just on the screen in, in the Monaco Media Center and you can never concentrate it and watch it properly. And now, okay, now it was another clash with the, with the cup final in Champions League and with Bavaria Munich, which is my, my hometown, but actually I'm not a big football fan, which helped a lot in the decision making. So I was probably the only one in the whole Munich who watched uh, the Indy 500. It was so cool just to sit on the sofa, watch a race, don't have to think about the stories you're going to write about it. And that was pretty cool. But um, actually, I think Scott Dixon should have won. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and and I had German like... commentary. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it, it wasn't biased. Um, the, I mean, the caution at the end was... I think a massive anticlimax. I understand the reasons for it, but it took away that kind of feeling of anticipation. And, you know, Scott Dixon was biding his time, but he wasn't in the right place at the right time. And that's what motorsport is about, Mark. Yeah, totally. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about um, what the history books show. And, you know, I think for Taku, he, he's worked hard at it. And, at the age of 43, I think even he's surprised to see himself running at the sharp end in Indy and then to steal this victory. And, you know, whether he did steal it or whether you feel that, that he richly deserved it, I think he certainly applied himself massively to the, the task of becoming an incredibly well-established and very quick uh, racer in IndyCar. And to get that second victory is terrific. And I, 
I, I have a, a soft spot, I think, for Taku, but possibly because I've had a number of different phases in my career when I've worked with Honda. And I think Honda, in, in many respects, doesn't quite get the recognition that it deserves as a Japanese company for what it has put into global motorsport uh, over the years. And I know how important that victory is for them. Of course, they, they dominate the grid at the Indy 500, but for their man, Takuma Sato, to win the race is a kind of a great, it's a particularly poignant kind of achievement for them. So I was delighted to see that. I completely agree with you. It was an anticlimax, but that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. You get these races where there's an outcome that ought to take place and there's the outcome that actually happens. And, you know, whether it's Lewis Hamilton finishing a Grand Prix with a wheel basically falling apart where he's got a, a tar coming off the rim uh, at Silverstone and still takes the victory. You know, the reality is we can appreciate how achievements like this occur in racing. And uh, I, as I say, I was very happy to see uh, Taku take the result. Now, Rika, I, I just wanted to come to you because you spoke about Alexander Rossi. And yeah. as someone who follows F1 and not IndyCar, yeah. To see him chucked to the back of the field all of a sudden for a penalty of an unsafe release, I was like, what on earth is going on? How is he at the back of the field? He's in a car that could potentially win. He was leading at points and dicing with Dixon and Sato. It seemed to me like a totally disproportionate um, penalty for you know what was something that it wasn't in his control. Yes, the team could do, but it didn't do any damage to anyone. I felt that uh, penalty was a bit anticlimactic and it threw him so far behind that then there was again a lot of dirty air and clearing those back markers or that, that particular section of grid was going to be that much more harder. And there was a point where at, I, I think when a race restarted, at some point he had overtaken five cars at the restart and he had showed some amazing skill and he was a delight to watch, whether at the front or the back. And I was hoping that he won somebody knew some a face that was known from the f1 paddock so yeah i was rooting for rossi more or less yeah it was, it was certainly fun to watch and fun yeah. not to have to work i think we can all agree on that um let's move on and talk about f1 because as we've already um given a large signpost to we now have the complete calendar 17 formula one races all there for everybody to see. We go through until the 13th of December, which is a really, really long time. But Christian, it's just, I think, an impressive feat that F1 have managed to put this together. Yeah, it's, it's a great achievement. I remember the, the comments from Ross Braun uh, and Chase Carey, the beginning of the, of the crisis, when they said, yeah, we're trying to still have 15 to 18 races and we thought they're crazy. Um, you cannot even think of, of one race at the moment, and they are talking about 15 to 18 races. And I really thought they are crazy, and especially saying that. Um, and now they have 17 races. Okay, we don't have, we, we haven't done it yet, but so far everything worked pretty pretty well. So um, great achievement from Formula One, from all the stakeholders. Um, really good work. Yeah, Mark. I mean, a big shout out to uh, Chloe Target Adams, who heads up the. The, the global race promoter business at Formula One. And she's got a great team, James Mulligan and Rian and Matthews and Georgina Bowie. And, you know, the, the, this team of people you know, out there dealing with the promoters, dealing with the nitty gritty of negotiating race contracts under very exceptional circumstances. So the types of commercial agreement they're having to strike are very different from, from the normal types of agreements that they put in place for all the reasons that we know about in terms of, either no spectators or a question mark over a spectator attendance. So I think for, uh, you know, for Chloe and, and her team at Formula One, um, they've done a magnificent job, which I'm sure Chase Carey and, and Ross Braun and, and the senior executive team will, will fully appreciate, um, has really saved Formula One. And I think not to put too fine a point on it, let's bear in mind that in a year when there is effectively no race promoter revenue, very, very limited race promoter revenue, if any at all, uh, in a year when there's no corporate hospitality uh, revenue, uh, when actually the savior of Formula One is to get the races staged so that you get the television revenue which comes in. And that creates the prize fund that will then be used in 2021 to 
uh, be distributed amongst all of the teams. And for some of the teams, that prize money is all, it, it, it determines their survival. And, and therefore, I think the job that they've put together, whilst fans and observers of the sport can say it's great that we have 17 races, actually for the Formula One teams participating, this is about survival. And uh, COVID-19 has become a slightly existential uh, issue for so many of the teams, I feel. And so I think the job they've done is, is absolutely brilliant. And let me just add, finally, for the sponsors in Formula One who, who must have spent April, May, June, wondering whether they were actually going to have an, a, a world championship that they could leverage and promote. Uh, these races have given them the opportunity to make the most out of, uh, you know, their investment in the sport. So I think, you know, whichever way you look at it, the that small team of people sit, sitting in London have pulled together a pretty miraculous outcome for our sport, and uh, and they richly deserve all the praise they get for doing so. Now, Harika, is there anywhere that you're surprised that Formula One is going to in this exceptional and extraordinary year? Um, I wasn't surprised. I was hoping it would happen at some point. So it wasn't very surprising. I knew they'd somehow get it going. But it's really nice to see tracks like Portimao, Mugello, Imola, places we'd never thought F1 would go to, come back onto the calendar. So I'm really excited for almost the rest of the races remaining. Christian, how are F1 making this work? How are they going to the likes of, you know, Turkey, Portimao, as Nharika says, these places that we thought F1 wouldn't ever go back to? Yes, as Mark mentioned earlier, the, the commercial circumstances are completely different to, to normal. So there is no at least for most of the races, the promoter is not paying the fee they usually pay. In average, usually the promoter pay like $30 million um, a year for Formula One to come to the, to the circuit. Now, and, and usually they just make the money back with, with tickets they sell, sell. But now they cannot sell any tickets. So the whole business model is completely different. So actually Formula One has to rent the circuits, at least most of the circuits, because they cannot pay for Formula One to come. The circuit itself, they, they have the problems because of the Corona crisis. Um, they are not rented the whole year. So they make a big loss. They have to try to get the money back so they cannot afford Formula One. So Formula One has to pay them to get the circuits. And um, that's the reason why we see so many tracks we usually don't see. Uh, that's also the reason why we see Germany back on the calendar. Usually there should have be, shouldn't have been the race this year. And that's the reason why we see it uh, at the Nürburgring and not at Hockenheim. Mark, I mean, you've, you've done some wheeling and dealing in your time. Yep. We've already spoken about the difficulty of, of doing this and putting this calendar together. Do you honestly believe these places coming in will just be a one-year wonder and then they'll disappear and, you know, we'll, we'll not go to Turkey again, we'll not go to Portimao again? Well, um, on the face of it, it should be a one-year wonder so long as COVID is a one-year wonder because, of course, there's no certainty over the fact that 2021 will revert to being a normal calendar and I hate to be uh, a little bit depressing about all of this but it, it is quite striking how many businesses and, and particularly when you read the media people talk about 2021 as if this crisis will have disappeared. The crisis will not disappear until there is a permanent solution to the spread of COVID-19 or until society around the world develops immunity and and so I think we're already beginning to see some realization that in just a few months time, when we look at the 2021 calendar, you know, will we be going to Australia? Will we be going to China? Will we be back into another season where Formula One could look quite different for the reasons that we know only too well? So I think that this year, you know, on paper, seems to be a bit of a one-off in terms of these venues. And, and I completely agree with what uh, Niharika said. You know, it's great that we're going to San Marino. It's great that we're going to Portimao, which is a track that I have raced at with, with my team, Status Grand Prix. Um, we're going to some amazing venues. Mugello, I've been to Mugello a few times. think it's an amazing place to visit, although I'm not sure that it'll be uh, a particularly good track for overtaking. But nevertheless, we're going to go to some interesting places. And that's going to be very interesting for broadcasters, for media, for fans, to, to, to see contemporary Formula One cars racing on tracks that we have not seen visit before. But to your point, 
Jenny, that the commercial reality of this could really be quite intriguing because what essentially has happened in 2021 is because of a, a, an event outside everyone's control, because of a global pandemic, everyone across the Formula One community, sponsors, Formula One teams, race promoters, have had to work together in a very new and very different way, much more collaboratively than perhaps they've ever done before. And you, you, you can see that through the way in which the budget cap was agreed. You can see that in the way in which the Concord Agreement has all been signed. There is a real sense that everyone is actually fighting the same battle and trying to make sure that this sport lives to, to fight another day uh, very well. I think the final part of this new era of Formula One that we're seeing in 2020 is that some of these countries, take Turkey for example, I could imagine a scenario where a country like Turkey or a country like Portugal sees the benefit of hosting these one-off Formula One events and thinks, why can we not have this come back again? Is there not something else that we can do to keep Formula One returning to our country. So I think the implications of these one-off events quite might be quite interesting. And who knows, maybe this will become the catalyst towards Liberty and Formula One getting their desired outcome of a 25 race Formula One calendar in the next few years. No, we ban you from saying anything like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jenny, but you know, we 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 know they're desperately trying to get there. And it'll be, by the way, it'll be very interesting to see how the two-day uh, event in uh, San Marino takes place. I'm really fascinated to see how that change in format takes place. Um, Marika, I just wondered, with all these different circuits coming back or being introduced, was there any hope, I suppose, that Formula One would return to India? Yes, I think it's, they have a fantastic circuit here, but knowing the situation that was unfolding in my country, the number of cases, if you can't go to Mexico or the United States, I think India is the third or fifth largest hotspot for COVID at the moment. And um, I didn't see, uh, there was no hope that they would come back because there are a lot of problems with the Indian Grand Prix and the circuit owners here. It's a whole different matter altogether. But I did hope for it to go to more traditional European circuits. But um, I guess this, the fact that F1 was the first sport to kick off on TV during this pandemic, um, it has tapped into almost quite a bit, quite a large audience back home. We see it on Twitter, we see it on Instagram. We've never seen so much of feedback when it comes to the sport during a group. Um, say on Instagram or Twitter, people are active, there are new fans being tapped into because everybody's idle, the screen time has increased. So I like the way F1's, you know, got a 17 race calendar in the first place going. I didn't expect more than 15, to be honest. I was not expecting the whole 17 race one. Yeah, so that's that. Uh, Niharika, I must tell you that a couple of weeks ago, I had to speak at a conference for a um, very large, very well-known Indian company, Infosys, based in uh, Bangalore. I think they've got a... Yeah. Uh, um, I think they've got a market capitalization of $56 billion, which yeah. is, uh, so they're not a small company. And uh, it was really interesting, senior executive team and plus executives all over the world from their business. And the level of interest in Formula One was extraordinary. It, yeah. was, it was, in fact, the guy who briefed me for the, the, uh, for the conference uh, proceeded to then start talking about tire compounds and, and uh, high rake Red Bull cars. And we were going into all of this great detail and it was, it was terrific to see. And I, I talked to some of them afterwards about you know, the way in which we really do need to go back to India. And actually, they were all in violent agreement with me. And there was no one arguing with me. Everyone was saying, oh, yes, you know, we've got to have Formula One uh, back in India one day. So I, I really do hope that with all this great work that Chloe and her team have done in Formula One, that there will be a fresh look at all of these other existing facilities, like the one that you have in India, because uh, I know so many people enjoyed racing there. And it would be great to get back into that huge uh, market when the type time is right. You'd be actually surprised. Um, I was surprised, in fact. There's another Indian company that's Infosys, similar to Infosys, that's actually on the McLaren. It's called the Wipro Information Technology. Oh, yeah. Wipro, Wipro's yeah. actually on a McLaren. And I, I, was, I had to Google and check if it's the Indian one. And I was wondering <laughs> how they reached that because we've never had anything more than TCS and three yeah. or four Indian faces in the entire sport now. So I was really happy to see them there. And yes, we do have a market. And I'd really be happy if that is had to come back to in this country. 
Yeah, I think as well, if you look at the German market, I mean, this has been a lifeline for you guys, hasn't it? Having the Grand Prix come back and, and having it in the Nürburgring, maybe it's, it just adds a little bit more spice to the market and more people will be interested? Yeah, but actually it's it's the wrong Nürburgring. It's not the old Nordschleife. That's, uh, <laughs> we can that's only dream. All, yeah, I, I think the Nürburgring, also the Grand Prix, um, circuit is, is a pretty pretty cool track and the facilities are amazing um, but it's not an Nordsch life everyone's hoping for all these series for DTM for everything to go back to the Nordsch life it's just not possible especially with Formula 1 of course um, but uh, yeah to be honest I, I was pretty surprised when I heard it for the first time that Formula 1 is coming to, to the Nürburgring instead of the Hockenheimring because since the Nürburgring was sold and hosted the last Grand Prix in 2013 it wasn't on radar anymore and um, so it was quite a big surprise, but the reasons were in the end quite obvious. As we said earlier, the, the business model changed um, drastically. So, yeah, I, I'm happy to be back at the Nürburgring because actually I've been to so many circuits the last years, but the Nürburgring I haven't seen since 2013. Christian, I have a question for you because I would say in the top five frequently asked questions I get when I, I speak at events in Germany are, are from people asking what's happened to the German Grand Prix and what's happened to the fan following for Formula One in Germany? Because not that many years ago, we remember going to German Grand Prix, particularly during the Schumi uh, era, and having an extraordinary amount of support for, for Michael, of course, and for Formula One. What's your kind of broad view of what's occurred over the last decade? I think the the culture we have here in Germany is completely different to to the motorsport culture you have in the UK or also in Austria, for example. It's completely different. In Germany, we have only Michael Schumacher fans, only Michael fans. They are not motorsport fans. They are not Formula One fans. They just supported Michael. Hmm. And I think that was um, probably, it's really sad that we didn't make more out of the opportunity we got with Michael. Then we were really, really lucky that we got Sepp and Nico um, as world champions again. But um, it's going to be interesting if Sepp is not driving for Ferrari anymore and probably at some point not in, in Formula One anymore, what's going to happen in, in Germany because we don't have that motorsport culture, unfortunately. So um, I, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm really jealous of what you have in the UK and what people have in, in Austria, wherever. And in Germany, it's, it's a bit different. I, to be honest, I don't know why, because we have the big manufacturers and we have an automotive culture, but not a, a motorsport culture. And even DTM is dying now. So it's really sad to see. It's uh, very convenient that you start talking about Sebastian Vettel, because we can't do a program without talking about his future. And Christian, you know, you're the man with his finger on the pulse when it comes to affairs in Germany. So what do you know? What can you tell us? What gossip is there? <laughs> um, Actually, the gossip is that um, it would be announced just uh, ahead of Spa, but um, that's just a gossip. I think that's coming from the Italian press. I haven't heard anything in, in particular what's going to happen. Of course, there are the rumors around Sepp joining uh, Racing Point. Some other people say there is still a chance that he will come back to, to Red Bull. Um, I've had a few calls with Dr. Helmut Marko, and he always said, no, uh, that's not going to happen. I remember the first time I asked him about the possibility of Sepp returning to Red Bull was, um, I think, more than one year ago. And he said, no, um, that's too expensive for us. We cannot afford it. Then the next time I asked him, no, two Vs um, is too much for Red Bull with Verstappen and Vettel. That's not going to happen. And then it, when it was finally announced that um, Ferrari and uh, Sepp are splitting ways, um, I called him again and he said, no, the situation for us didn't change. Where should all the millions um, come from? And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the situation, I think, I think. And, and Zepp was saying that in, in TV and Austrian television, that if he would get an offer from Red Bull, he would sign. And I think he still has this really little, little hope that um, Elben is um, having more problems at Red Bull and, and gets that chance. Marika, F1 thrives, doesn't it, on this driver market, on speculation and rumour and intrigue about who's going to go where. What do you think is going to happen? What would your readers, I suppose, love to happen with Sebastian Vettel? Um, well, I think um, 
if the Italians are to be believed, uh, and I'm assuming, assuming they're right, he'll go to Racing Point. But my question is, that's almost a team designed keeping Lance in mind. Or, you know, if it, even if it becomes Aston Martin, that he'll be the highlight. Does Seb want to be paired alongside him? Will he be happier than he was at Ferrari? Or will it be a completely new challenge so i don't know i mean that's the only uh, from what it looks like it's aston martin or nothing for him i don't see him going to red bull unless they make that exception but um yeah it's it's really hard to tell when it comes to sebastian because i think i would hate to see him forced out with the sport that's the that's the one part that my readers or anybody following it doesn't want to see so we know what we don't want to see but i guess what transpires is a different matter altogether mark Niharika, I'm so pleased that you're on, on board with wanting to keep Sebastian in Formula One because that's where I am. I think he's got a lot to offer this sport going forward. I think we've got to keep our world champions in the sport, particularly when they're young enough. And he's, my goodness, he's a lot younger than Fernando Alonso, who's going to return to Formula One next year. And I've been very vocal about the fact that uh, whenever I've been asked about this, I really hope Sebastian is signed by Racing Point. I think that Lawrence Stroll... Um, is developing a very interesting business there. Aston Martin have a close relationship with Daimler Benz. Daimler, Daimler is a shareholder. Total Wolf himself personally is a shareholder in the Aston Martin car company. And I think Mercedes and Aston Martin's strategic relationship is going to get stronger in Formula One. And if the worst that happens for Lawrence Stroll going forward is that his Aston Martin Formula One team finishes second in the Constructors' Championship to Mercedes-Benz, he's going to be an extremely happy guy because he associates Formula One very much with his ambitions to re-establish or to, to firmly establish Aston Martin on an upwards trajectory as a car company. So I think Red Bull and Ferrari have got a problem now, which is effectively they're going to have two Mercedes-Benz teams to beat. One's going to be called Aston Martin. The other one is, is the one which Total Wolf r runs. And I think for Sebastian Vettel, the Aston Martin opportunity represents a formidable one because he should be faster than Lance Stroll. Uh, he should effectively be the team leader in that team. And it's a team which I know very well. There are, there are key people there like uh, Andrew Green, the technical director, and Andy Stevenson, uh, the, the sporting director, who've been there since the Jordan team started in 19. 91. So they've, they've got 30 years experience of working in that business. And the one thing that those guys and the rest of the people who work with them are very conscious of is how to build a happy team, build a team around someone. And I think Sebastian Vettel, more than anything, needs a fresh mental approach to Formula One. I think Ferrari, for all kinds of reasons, has worn him down over the years. So I really I'm passionately hope that Lawrence Stroll and the guys at Racing Point stroke Aston Martin get Sebastian Vettel. It'll be a disappointing outcome for Sergio Perez, but I'm sure his manager, Julian Jacobi, is well able to find Sergio uh, an alternate role in Formula One if, if there is one available for him. Uh, but I really want to see Sebastian there. I would like nothing better in six months' time to see Sebastian Vettel in an Aston Martin ahead of a Ferrari in a Formula One race. That's got to be something worth waiting for. Ouchy. <laughs> um, right, before we go, I want to hear from each one of you, which is the race that you are looking forward to the most out of the next three? Because we have Spa, Monza and Mugello. All three, you could say, have their own reason and identity to be very excited about. So, uh, Christian, we'll start with you and then we'll come to Neharika and then Mark. Uh, I, I would go for Mugello because I love Italy. Um, unfortunately, without any Ferrari fans this year, but Italy is always fantastic. And then a new circuit, of course, Monza, the, the, the circuit itself is fantastic, but then to have a new circuit, and uh, as Mark touched on earlier, Mugello is a fantastic circuit. I've been there once or twice. Um, I really look forward to go there. I think I'm looking forward to Mugello because Spa and Monza are known zones and Mugello is the unknown. And there's three fast corners. I think, what is it? Casanova or Savi, Arabiata one and two. I think there's a section of three corners that is really exciting to watch in other series. And I will really want to see how modern F1 cars perform around that one. I hope we get to see racing there, but um, it's one of the circuits we haven't watched before. So I think out of these three, that would be my choice too. 
Well, I'm afraid I'm, uh, I'm going to be a little bit boring and say Spa Francorchamps because I've had too many good experiences there. Jordan Grand Prix won its very first pole position there. We won our very first Formula One race there in '98. My good friend Mika Hakkinen is this year celebrating or commemorating 20 years since his famous victory over Michael uh, Schumacher, including that extraordinary uh, overtaking manoeuvre, which we all remember when they decided to use Ricardo Zonta as a 180 mile per hour chicane uh, on the run down to Le Combe. So I'm afraid I'm a bit of a spa uh, fan. And uh, Jenny, in, in many years time when you are uh, maybe my age and, uh, and a very uh, experienced Formula One uh, broadcaster with many years behind you, somewhere in those grandstands when I'm in my late 70s, I will be there uh, still going to, I think if I had one Formula One race to go to every year, I would go to Spa because I think it's just a wonderful uh, venue for, for our sport. But Mark, I'm... do you think Spa is still the same with so many high speed corners being flat now and uh, a lot of gravels being removed for, for tarmac runoff areas? See, one of the things, Christian, about getting older, you see, I'm wearing glasses. And, uh, and I think it's as part of the way life prepares you for, for, for getting older is that you can't actually see as well as you used to. So actually, I think Spa still looks pretty impressive. Of course, you with your youth and your good eyesight, you can see all the differences. But you make a very good point. I mean, when we won at Spa in 98, we had the bus stop chicane and it was... It was like a bus stop. It was a chicane. It was crazy. It was, it was actually quite impractical for Formula One cars, but it was a really unique challenge. And I remember when they basically flattened the bus stop, the entry to the bus stop, I remember thinking, you know, it's going too far. But I still, I still fundamentally love the fact that you can look at a photograph of a modern Formula One car going around the La Source hairpin, and you can then go online and you can see... A, f a photograph of Fangio or Sterling Moss taking that same corner back in the 1950s. And, and, I, and I think that heritage of, the, heritage of this track has been actually quite remarkably uh, protected, even in our safety uh, conscious and quite rightly so safety conscious world that we have today. Well, guys, that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much for spending an evening with me chatting uh, about motorsport and the thing we love more than anything. I'm sad that I won't be able to see any of you for any kind of time soon but nevertheless stay safe enjoy the season because it's going to be fast and frantic from now on in and uh, let's hope for a really good I was going to say a really good battle but maybe a midfield battle that we can get excited about because I can't see anything else happening unfortunately <laughs> um, take care guys thanks a lot Very and good. bye for now thanks so much bye, bye.